Welcome to the Unlist. This is technically version two of a video I tried uploading a few days ago, but I had a little trouble with that video because there was some content in that video which is factually incorrect. And uh, make a long story short, this video is about the Christian Dior fragrance, Diorella, as was the original version of this video. In the old version, I was comparing the vintage sample to what I thought was a new sample of the same perfume, and it smelled oddly older to me. Like, and I just took that as part of the reformulation. Maybe they decided to make some changes so it smelled more nostalgic for whatever reason. I thought that was the way it was supposed to be. And that was how I discussed the comparison of the new and old Diorella. Come to find out, that new Diorella sample was actually mislabeled and misfilled, and it contains an older fragrance called Diorling. So now I get to go back and resample that mislabeled Diorling and write a review on it, first of all, and then maybe I'll do a video about it later. So I decided, since I don't like to edit videos, everything is done pretty much off the cuff, I would just take it down and redo it. So this is basically version two of my Diorella episode. So a lot of the same things I've said in the previous version still stand. So I'm just gonna give you the Cliff Notes version since I now no longer have to compare two samples together with each other. So that, that frees up some of the video space making this a shorter video. <clears throat> so originally I was given a sample pass full of fragrances, some vintage, some new, in some cases vintage and new versions of the same fragrance for comparison purposes to see how things change via reformulation. And among the samples in that pass was Diorella. So Diorella I've never smelled before until I smelled it last weekend. And Diorella belongs to a number of Dior fragrances either made directly for Christian Dior or after his death made for the house based on his personal tastes in fragrance. So effectively what we now refer to as the Monsieur Dior collection, which is what they're known as now, they've all been reissued in their own bottles and given this name, the Monsieur Dior collection starts all the way back with the first fragrance, which is Miss Dior in 1947, created by Paul Vasher. Uh, shortly thereafter, they got a perfumer named Edmund Runitska, who uh, came off of working with um, Elizabeth Arden. He did uh, Ondi and It's You for Elizabeth Arden. He also did some things for Marcel Rochas around this time as well, and he did uh, one fragrance for Hermes, but the bulk of Edmund Runitska's creative output was for Christian Dior. He wasn't ever officially a Dior house perfumer because other perfumers came and went, made things for Dior at the same time Rudnitska was. So it can't be misconstrued that he was ever officially house Dior perfumer. He just made the bulk of his work for Dior for one reason or another. Maybe he liked Christian Dior. He continued to make a few fragrances for the house upon uh, Christian Dior's death anyway, so kind of goes without saying there. So the thing that makes Diorella worth making a video about, in this case twice, is the fact that Diorella is a fragrance with a lot of history and a fragrance that we can almost look at as part of an evolution of a single accord concept that Edmund Runitska had been working on for the better part of 35 years. And he started working on this Accord concept back in the 50s. And it's a concept that goes for a very sort of transparent, fresh, uplifting smell interlaced with some very vivid, lucid, some may say, uh, fruit notes that have a very ripe smell to them. And he was trying to create uh, fruit accords that did not previously exist in conventional perfumery. So he was uh, 
working with synthetic materials that other perfumers had not really worked with before. And these were not materials he invented, so don't get it twisted. He never invented these materials, but he used them in very uh, groundbreaking ways. And he was among the first perfumers to actually use these materials, aside from the chemists in the labs who obviously developed those materials. They were the true first uh, chemists to use them. So a lot of these materials, uh, one of them was hydroxycitronella, which he actually used to create the first really lifelike Lily of the Valley Accord, or Mugit Accord, that he would put into a fragrance called Diorama. And Diorama is one of those Monsieur, uh, Monsieur uh, Dior collection fragrances. And among the ones that uh, Runitska himself worked on, Diorama, um, Diorella, uh, Diorissimo, Dior Dior, and then there's uh, Cologne, Eau Fresh, and its stronger version of Eau Fresh. And then he also did uh, Eau Sauvage, which is not part of that range, but it's in that same time period. <coughs> um, and uh, the thing is, Runitska was slowly, I guess you could say, evolving this chord over time. So its first appearance in a fragrance would probably be Eau Fresh in 1953, I believe. And it's a sort of combination of like a fleshy peach, which is utilizing some sort of black tone note, like Mitsoku also does that to create a peach note. Uh, so again, he wasn't the first person to do it, but he just did it in a very innovative way. And then, of course, uh, he put some of that Lily of the Valley raw material in there, that uh, hydroxytronella. And then he also factored in a very, very tiny, minuscule pinch of something that colloquially was known as uh, watermelon ketone, but we now know it today as Kalone or Kalone 1951. So the crazy thing about that material is that material was kind of microdosed by Runitska to create a salty, uh, ripe melon effect. And nobody would do that for probably 30 years, 50s to 60s, 60s to 70s, 70s to 80s. It wouldn't be until the late 80s, guys, the late 80s, that k -Lone would finally become prominently used by commercial perfumery. And it started with fragrances that, surprise, surprise, were trying to have like a melon note in them. In this case, stuff like Calyx by Prescriptives or uh, Aramis New West, Low DC, stuff like that. And of course, those fragrances all have very big, huge, obvious doses of that Kalo note, which would become a point of contention for a lot of fragrance enthusiasts and collectors in the online community. We sometimes like to make fun of those fragrances from that late 80s until about, I want to say, mid to late 90s period. We call them K-Lone bombs or whatever. And, you know, for a while, k -Lone was thrown under the bus as a bogeyman material in the same way that Ambroxan was thrown under the bus as a bogeyman material. And now I think we've moved on from uh, hazing Ambroxan to now it's Woody Ambers. Everyone... It's constantly going, oh, it's full of Ambrofix. Oh, it's got a bunch of Ambermax in it. That's the, that's the bogeyman now. The bogeyman has, has left Ambroxan and left Kalo. Now the bogeyman is, is Woody Ambers. Those are the things that we blame for the decline of Western civilization. Oh, everything's gone to, to hell because of Woody Ambers, right? But before that, everything was going to hell because of Ambroxan. And then before Ambroxan, Everything was going to hell because of Kalo. I mean, so things have been going to hell for a long time, haven't they? God, it's been like 30... We've been like... We've been dead for 30 years now. We've been zombies for such a long time. It's, it's so weird. People just get kind of sad, don't they, when they go down that, like, nihilistic path of thought there. But I'm veering off topic here. Let me get back on point. So, Diorella had a very tiny dose of that as well. Although Runitska wasn't really satisfied with that. He wanted a much bigger, more obvious, uh, transparent, fruity accord because he was all about pushing materials, pushing uh, abstract concepts. He liked to really create and innovate. He wasn't just 
He wasn't like Gene Kaleo, where Gene Kaleo just wanted oak moss, oak moss, oak moss, oak moss, oak moss, rose, 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 sandalwood, oak moss, rose, rose, wood, sandalwood, oak moss, rose, sandalwood, oak moss, rose, rose, rose. That Gene Kaleo was like a one-trick pony. He just wanted everything to smell like 1920. He never wanted to leave 1920. And I can't blame him, okay? That stuff smells really good. You know, Patupura smells amazing. Uh, 1000 smells amazing, you know. Okay, those are great. Those are great fragrances. All right, let's not get it twisted here. But they are very, very super duper traditional, very traditional French fragrances. Edmund Bernitzko was like anything but traditional. He was not obsessed with naturals. He was not obsessed with certain materials. He was not obsessed with uh, traditional French structures or accords. If anything, he was obsessed with the accord that would go into Diorella and was also in eau fresh to a degree and uh he would build a perfume that i guess some could say was his piece de resistance but it would never get released during his lifetime and this fragrance was known internally as the plum because he would let his wife wear it and this fragrance had a much larger dose of this kalo material and it had the lactones too it had a plum note hence the name the plum and it also had heavy on in it as well so, I mean, it had, it had these materials in it, but it was much more pushing, futuristic, much more in what we would consider an aquatic vein. I mean, it wasn't an aquatic fragrance, so again, don't get it twisted, but it was much more watercolor in nature, and he could not find a buyer for that fragrance. He tried selling it three times. He tried selling it once in the 50s to Dior, who turned it down. He tried selling it again to Dior, who turned it down, and then he tried the third time to submit it to a brief for Guy La Roche and their fragrance, Fiji. Josephine Catapano of IFF won that brief, and her fragrance became what we now know as Fiji. So this poor plum fragrance ended up just becoming his wife's bespoke scent, and he would continue to work on it and change it and improve it over the years, but it would never see the light of day again. Nobody would ever hear about it, aside from those who smelled her, like the social functions that the Runitskas would attend, you know, fashion functions and perfume society functions, and she would show up wearing this fragrance, and everyone would compliment on it and comment on it and ask, can they get it? Is it? And he'd be like, nope, I'm not selling it, because he had just gotten tired of trying to submit it and it being kicked back at him. So he just would, instead, he would take the, the basics of the plum, and he would kind of shrink it down. And this is where Diorella comes into play here. He would shrink it down and staple it onto a more traditional sheep format. So we're talking <clears throat> uh, bergamot, we're talking a little bit of aldehydes here, we're talking uh, rose, we're talking carnation, patchouli, oak moss, your basic green, so galbanum as well, basil as well, your basic green, what would be 70s era sheep or accord, but it would have a little bit of this uh, fruity rotten peach in there, a little bit of this salty watermelon vibe, the cantaloupe melon vibe, this transparentness, this watercolor facet, just much more subdued compared to the plum. Which, by the way, the plum would eventually be released posthumously as the famous uh, Le Parfum de Therese by Frederick Mahl, because Teresa Runitska would give the formula to Frederick Mahl after her husband's death and trust him with it. And he would twist her arm until she said yes and he could release it to the public. So if you do want to smell the plum, you can. You just got to pay like $300 for it. And it's, uh, you know, it's a Frederick Mahl fragrance now. But it, it, it's not the last Runitska fragrance because it's not the newest. The newest is actually Ocean Rain by Mario Valentino. That fragrance kind of deserves its own video, so I'm going to talk about that fragrance separately. But let's say that Mario Valentino Ocean Rain would be the final iteration of that accord. The accord that started in, you know, the plum and ended up in Eau Fresh and then also ended up in Diorella. It would end up in Ocean Rain as well. The salty watermelon, the peach notes that lactonic nature, that saltiness, the sourness, the transparent, um, the heavy on the cord. More prominent though than Diorella because Ocean Rain was actually trying to be an aquatic because it was 1990. And by that point, 
that kind of fragrance was no longer strange, no longer cutting edge. It's still a weird fragrance, don't get, don't get me wrong. That's why it's going to get its own video. But it's still a very strange fragrance. Even for 1990, it was very weird. But it was much less, less weird than it would have been had it been released back in the 50s, 60s, etc. So, Diorella <coughs> really sort of gave people their first glimpse of this emergent, transparent, fruity style. And you can tell that the success of Diorella inspired other houses to try and do something similar, although I wouldn't say they did as good a job. Like Henry Robert, who was still with Chanel at the time, he would uh, actually uh, consult Ronitska and Ronitska would help him understand what he was doing and then he could use that uh, knowledge to create Cristal. Now Ronitska is not technically a perfumer listed as uh, officially having created Cristal but it's noted that uh, Henry Robert did actually uh, like I said did, did coordinate with Ronitska. They, they talked and shared notes so indirectly Indirectly, Rubitska helped create Crystal, which would come out two years later. And then, of course, you know, we would also see things of that nature continue to emerge into the late 70s and the early 80s. And eventually, that more transparent, fruity, floral, watercolor style, it would get sweeter and more fruity as materials advanced. You know, in the 70s, examples like that were much sharper. I mean, Crystal is very cold, very cold, sharp fragrance. Diorella, while not necessarily cold, is much sharper thanks to its sheep underpinnings. And then, of course, you know, uh, Diorella would be the second to last fragrance that uh, uh, Runitsko would make. He would make, uh, I think, Diorissimo would be 76, and that was it. He was done. <clears throat> he, was, he was bowing out. And then he would not make another fragrance until he was 85 years old. <laughs> Mario Valentino Ocean Rain. He would come out of retirement because he was already, uh, you know, was already in his 70s or pushing 70. He would come out of retirement at 85 to make Ocean Rain one last hurrah and then go back into retirement. In the meantime, he would train two students. He would train uh, Pierre Bourdon and he would train Jean Claude Elena. And you see what kind of work they both put out. I mean, Jean Claude Elena effectively wrote a love letter. To Ode Hermes with his uh, declaration for Cartier and then that whole experience informed his entire style that he would develop in the 2000s as house perfumer for Hermes. Meanwhile Pierre Bourdon would take the aquatic Calone elements and all that and he would fashion stuff like green Irish tweed and cool water out of that and eventually we would get what you could sort of call like the grandson of Diorella in the form of uh, Creed Millicene Imperial. So now that I've mentioned this, those of you guys who've smelled or own Millicene Imperial, you should go check out Diorella. You will see the connection. It's very, very clear. And those of you who have smelled both or have access to both are now going to do a side-by-side. -side. You're going to check out Millicene Imperial and you're going to smell Diorella and you're going to be like, yeah, I totally see it. The salted melon, the fruit notes. There's no really, there's no real peach note though, and in, in Milsim Imperial, there's no peach note there, so there will be some differences, but you'll definitely see it, and you can follow the lineage on up from Diorella to Ocean Rain to Milsim Imperial. You can see it just kind of forms a sort of like ancestry tree, because it just travels from Rudnitska onto his students, and his students would continue to would continue to develop the basic tenets and concepts of his work, and that's what makes. This also interesting, and that's what made Diorella so interesting to experience and to wear because you're looking at a fragrance from 1972, okay, that was effectively a window into what fragrances would eventually be like in the late 80s, 90s, and arguably 2000s as well. Because we had a lot of very K Lone dependent fragrances in the 2000s too. We had Polo Blue, okay, we had a lot of stuff. So, it's, it's not like it just stopped with the 90s. And <clears throat> even though Diorella is not an aquatic and it's not a Kalon bomb, like I said, it does have a focus on those very modern materials, you know, the hydroxy citronella, the hedione, 
the watermelon ketone, all of those things, the, the, the lactonic notes, the little bit of aldehydes, it's all very transparent watercolor and it's very, very smart. And uh, I'm not sure we're gonna see perfumery that smart uh, again for a long time, not under the current economic environment. This has been The Unlist.